River Church. Thank you for joining us here in person and online. Will you please join us in this time of worship and reflection?
Jesus, for coming down to this earth for us, Lord. Thank you for your cross, Father. You saved our lives, Lord, and we can't thank you enough. You've done so many great things, Lord. All we can do is adore you. Thank you for this day, Lord, for this place to meet as a church, God. Please bless this time together that we have, Father. Pray in Jesus' name. Church, will you please stand and sing with us?
26, 6 says, While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her.
us think about that this morning, the song we just sung, all our hearts, all our souls, everything we own, given up to you. Are we doing that every day, Lord? Are we thinking about that every day? Are we giving everything over to you, Lord? Whether it's a struggle that we have, whether it's praise that we know is a blessing from you, are we giving it all up to you, Lord? Are we making sure that you are at the center of our lives? Let's think about this that this morning for a moment. Pray on that, that we are able to do that each and every day. In each and every moment that comes into our lives, it's you we turn to first. just a quick announcement about some parties that we're having this week. They're called painting parties. Who likes painting parties? We had one yesterday too. There were more than 20 of us at the building yesterday painting and siding and cleaning up and doing different things around the building. It was amazing and when we were praying this morning, some of us pray at 8.30 uh, about our weeks. Anybody that's asked for prayer about the service, and one of us prayed that it was amazing just hearing all the different conversations and the voices in the building, just things that were happening and people working and just enjoying what they were doing. It was amazing. So on Tuesday night, the youth group, they're going to attack their, their youth group room, and uh, I think the color's Jubilee is the name of the color, so that's going to be good for the youth group room. That'll be awesome, so they'll be able to have some fun doing that. And then on Wednesday night, it's ladies' night, so the ladies are going to get together and, and paint some of the area, one of them still in the auditorium, the stage area that needs to be done. And then the um, alcove in the cafe area, which we didn't get to yesterday, so that'll be fun. And then the guys are going to come in as the cleanup crew on Thursday and kind of try to finish whatever hasn't been finished, and we'll try to get that done. And we definitely should have the top floor done, hopefully, this week. That's the goal. And then we'll continue to work on the bottom floor. So if you can, come out. It's a party. We're going to feed you. If nothing else, that'll be the attraction. Come get fed. So in more ways than one, not just with food, with the fellowship as well. So I'll pray over Josh as he comes up. Lord, Acts is such an amazing book in the Bible. It really tells us the vision of what a church should be. The early church, they had struggles. They had triumphs. And every church will go through the same things or something similar, no matter the day or age. Please just let us listen to these messages that we've been given through Acts and to dive more deeper into the Word so that we can understand as a church what we need to do and what our roles are. We ask you this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you haven't seen the pictures on Instagram or Facebook and you're curious what color we're painting in the church, I did you all a solid today because I am wearing the auditorium colors. This is my auditorium preaching outfit. The auditorium is moon mist blue, which is pretty close to what I have as a shirt. And we've got uh, dark brown carpet coming a week from tomorrow. And then the idea visually for River Church is that when you walk in the main hallway entrance, auditoriums to your left, cafe and offices to your right, is that the hallway has like the deepest blue, the bluest blue, kind of the darkest blue. And then anywhere you go from there, it gets progressively lighter and brighter as there's more windows in lighter colors. So I actually don't know how many, I love this shirt and, and it's very comfortable and it doesn't wrinkle easily. And uh, it fits well in my current state of being steady. And um, 
I don't know if I can wear it in the new church because I might just disappear. It's like a, I might, it might just be like this wacky looking floating head with like, the rest of me, I might just like hands and anyway. So we'll see. Uh, just for grins, I might pop by the church this afternoon and take a picture and maybe I'll post it and show you guys and you'll see like, maybe Josh can't wear this anymore because he'll just disappear. But uh, this is roughly, if you're going to name your church after a river, you're going to paint it blue, right? So we're having fun with blue. The lower level is going to be various shades of uh, green. So that'll be kind of fun. And the floor in the lower level will be done by Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, the final step in the concrete polishing is taking place mid to late week this week. So uh, that floor should come to life and be shiny and kind of cool looking with uh, cool green. It'll be great. So like Kevin said, if you have the time, come on out. If you don't, make the time because it is a blessing. So what does River Church look like? Well, it kind of looks like me today. Uh, but what does River Church actually look like? Let me describe to you the kind of people that make up River Church that I just love so much. My friends at River Church have made clear decisions of faith and they're acting on them. They can, not that they would, but I could, by their actions, go family by family, individual by individual, and illustrate to you the decisions of faith that they've made, that their commitment to the Lord, uh, their presence, either in person or online, their faithfulness and tithes and offerings, their kindness towards me and my family. So when it comes to what does River Church actually look like, and now I'm talking about the people and not the building. There are folks that have real lives with real demands on their time, with real challenges, who have made real decisions of faith. And I could illustrate time after time that I have seen the Holy Spirit move powerfully through their lives. Sometimes the people of River Church can see it for themselves and can join me in being grateful with them, how the Lord is pouring into their life powerfully. Sometimes they can't see it, and it's my joy to point it out to them. They're, they're people who have made decisions of faith, and I can prove it. Uh, they're also people with great differences. And, and the cool thing about differences is that we know scripturally from creation that our Heavenly Father has created a people for himself, of whom River Church is a part, but they are not all alike. They are not homogenous. Even within River Church, there are great differences of lifestyles, of uh, work ethics, of opinions, of biblical knowledge, of life experience. There are, they are people who are tremendously different. And we hope that those differences are celebrated. We hope that we continue to attract people who are not like us. Uh, so we know that differences are amazing, and there are many differences within River Church. We also know, however, that we know what the evil one does with those godly differences is that he tries to turn the corner from difference to division. And so I also know if I'm going to describe what River Church looks like, that there's always the temptation of division, of taking sides of forming opinions about people and prioritizing the wrong things about them. If I were to extend my description of River Church all the way to the other end of the spectrum, I would say that there are, I know for a fact, that there are people who are part of River Church that everything I've already said is true about them and then if you were to play a word association game with them and say Donald Trump, they would say Adolf Hitler. I'm not kidding right now. Every time Donald Trump comes up, they bring up Adolf Hitler or a Nazi regime. They attend River Church. There are people at River Church that every time you mention Joe Biden, they think Karl Marx or socialism. They really believe that. And it even goes further. There, there are folks at River Church where differences have become divisive or potentially divisive, where they actually think if someone voted for one of those two guys, they're impugning their faith maturity. How could a solid man or woman of God vote for fill in the blank? Those people are here. It's not just in our society. And let me tell you right now, we love them. These are people that I know have known for at least six or seven years, if not 16 or 17 years, that I would happily associate with, I'm proud to associate with, I'm proud to say that they are part of the River Church family. And yet there are times when it feels like 
differences have become divisive. Something that God gave to us to celebrate has become something that we use to actually accuse each other of not being consistent men and women of faith or solid in their faith or whatever. Uh, it kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, is there some mastermind behind all of the division and the politics these days? Is there one man who just <laughs> is really the puppet master pulling all of the strings? Is it possible? I don't know. It's something I have to ponder and think about. It's ridiculous. <laughs> the first century church struggled with the same question. We want to celebrate our created differences. And we want to defeat and be aware of the goal of our enemy, which is to turn those differences into divisive matters where we actually accuse men and women of faith of not even being Christians at all, or maybe they're not good ones, and it becomes divisive. If you have your Bibles, please join me in Acts chapter 15 where this exact scenario was lived out in the first century church. The disciples had a problem. They implemented a scriptural and biblical solution and it's, it's a longer text. I'm going to move through it quickly. We're going to read it in little verse chunks today. And we are going to get some amazing guidance on how do we celebrate our differences and defeat the evil one when he tries to turn those differences into division. Here we go. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers. They, they traveled from uh, Jerusalem, Judea, these are Jews, and they're traveling down to Antioch, which is where the story starts out. And, and when the scripture again says that someone's coming down from Judea or Jerusalem, they're not talking about north, south, east, or west. They're talking about actually coming down. So Judea was at an elevation that was higher than Antioch, even though Antioch is to the north. Modern day Antioch is the same place that we're referring to in the scripture here. It's in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Ocean. Men came down from Judea, Jews, and began to teach the brothers in Antioch about uh, a day or two journey north of Jerusalem, but down in elevation. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. Division. These are Christian men visiting Christian men and saying you have a flap of skin that proves you are not a Christian man. River Church always does PG sermons. Moms and dads, you do with that what you will. But that's what this is talking about. I, that's what this is. You have a skin flap. You have a piercing. You have a tattoo. You have a freckle. You have a dyed hair color. Whatever you want. We're talking about something that means nothing. Men from Jerusalem, meaning well, from Judea, Jews, Orthodox Jews came to Antioch, a, a, a pagan church, a, a goyim church, a non-Jewish church, and said, because you're not Jewish enough, you aren't Christian at all. They were different, now it's divisive. Meant well, divisive. But after Paul and Barnabas, who were hanging out in Antioch, had engaged them in serious argument and debate, the church arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some of the others to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. Let me tell you one thing we know about the apostle Paul. Have you read the book of Romans? The man knows how to debate. They couldn't figure it out. Face-to-face -face conversations, the scripture says, serious argument and prolonged debate. They were fighting about skin flaps and they couldn't come to an accord with the apostle Paul. Like you think he would have won. He couldn't win. Serious difference that had now become divisive. And so what, so we, we see that this is what they do is they made a decision. This is not going to be settled here with the people who are currently in the room. We've given it enough time. Everyone has said all the words. We're still divided. Now what do we do? Well, the scripture says, that they arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. 
they defaulted to a scriptural means of leadership. We gotta bump this up a level. We gotta take this to someone or some people or a group that is firmly based in scripture that we can all respect and a decision is going to be made by them that we will then fall in line with. When it comes to, to disciples who differ, they submit themselves to biblical authority. So it's the first point in the text. We're gonna move through the text verse by verse today. Disciples who differ submit themselves to biblical authority. This is one of the beauties of being in a denomination, which River Church really isn't, is that if there's a local church problem and there's lots of discussion and differences become divisive, you can always bump it up to the state level or even the national level. What River Church has instead is relationships with like-minded churches. We're all here for each other, but there's no one that's gonna tell us what to do and we have to do it. But it is one of the beauties of a denomination. You can take it up a level. And so for instance, we see this in the life of Israel. If there was a dispute between fellow Israelites and they couldn't work it out, they would take it to their tribal leader. And then that guy would work it out. But if he couldn't work it out, they'd bump it up to Moses himself. And then if they really couldn't work it out, they would summon the priest who would then ask for a decision from God. And so we've always seen that it's a scriptural model that when differences become divisive, we bump it up a level. It's very biblical, it's very holy. The big idea is that we are always in submission to somebody or some buddies who are greater than ourselves. So the best example of that here at River Church for me personally is why we have elders. There are two guys that are toe to toe with me and I'm accountable to them. And so at least in River Church, we have our own little local system of, I don't get to do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want, with whom I want, I am accountable. And as we continue to grow, that group will grow. And so we have an in-house way of bumping it up to another level. We better be responsible to somebody in a family. If there's a dispute between the kids, they take it in my family anyways, growing up, we took it to mom. And then if we were still being divisive, we took it to dad. And there's, this is how it works. We are always in submission to an authority that we give more, that we humble ourselves to. This is biblical. This is how we go. Disciples who differ submit themselves to biblical authority. If you want to know if someone in a local church is being divisive, they won't go and talk to the pastor. That's divisive. If someone in Antioch said, nah, nope, you guys go on without me. Nothing's gonna change my mind. I don't care what the apostles have to say in Jerusalem. They're not living my life. They're not walking in my shoes. They don't know nothing about me. That's divisive. That's not differing, that's divisive. The kid that refuses his parents' discipline, divisive. The church family that won't submit to the pastor's authority or the elder's authority, divisive. The employee that won't submit to their supervisor or their boss, won't even talk to them, divisive, right? So differing disciples, will submit themselves to an authority that is greater than themselves. Divisive disciples will say, I'm the end all be all authority. Moving on through the text. In verse three, chapter 15, when they, Paul and Barnabas and a few others, had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, explaining in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they created great joy among all the brothers. Here's the message. Jesus is alive and moving through people who are not like us. Jesus is moving differently. People who are not born or raised as Jews are finding Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit is filling them just like they filled us. It's different. Different brought great joy. So they visited a couple of towns. They needed places to stay as they were traveling to Jerusalem, and they spread this word of encouragement that Jesus is moving differently. Verse four, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Buzz kills. Super sweet vibe, right? They hadn't seen each other for a while. They're returning to the mothership. They've been out on the frontier sharing the gospel. They've got great stories to tell. And so there's this intentional party 
They were welcomed by the church after they arrived. And the apostles came and the elders came and they started to talk and were reporting what God had done. But then some believers from the party, they came and broke up the party. Disciples who differ, the whole reason they're there is because they're going to have a fight, right? We need to make a decision. We're going to have a debate, right? But before we have the debate, can, can we have some coffee and cookies? And the answer is, yeah, haven't seen each other for a while. It was like the sweetness that was yesterday. Oh, it was so sweet to see people we haven't seen in a while sharing stories and catching up. It was amazing. So that's the vibe that's happening here. Disciples who differ, we're here for a fight, okay? We're here for a debate. But disciples who differ prioritize hospitality over hostility. Second point. Disciples who differ prioritize hospitality over hostility. Why? In the process of being intentionally kind to someone, meeting their needs. Can I take your jacket? Can I find you a Lysol wipe? Would you like me to put on my mask or would you feel more comfortable with my mask down? Let's not lick each other today. Would you like a cookie? Do you take sugar in your coffee? When we extend kindness, hospitality to each other, we get to experience the whole person, not just the thing that is different and potentially divisive. And as Christians, why do you think God commands us to show hospitality? Part of the reason is, is so that we begin to fall in love with the person. You know how it is when you were a kid and you have a friend and they might be your best friend and my favorite color is blue. Well, my favorite color is blue and I like Levi jeans. Well, I like Levi jeans. I think Susie's cute. Susie's a babe. I can't stand math. I hate math. I love Jim. I love Jim too. Dodgeball's my favorite. Dodgeball's my favorite too. I love the chocolate eclairs with the little cookie crumbles that we get sometimes on Wednesday afternoons. What? I like the fudgesicles. Well, we can't be best friends. We've all done that, but it's too late. We've already fallen in love with the person and we decide that maybe our best friend can like fudgicles and we can like the chocolate eclairs and it'll be okay. Because we have already extended hospitality and kindness to each other. Disciples who differ prioritize hospitality over hostility. Disciples who are divisive won't. Disciples who are divisive, they walk in the room and they want to have the fight. They're not offering you a Lysol wipe. Disciples who are divisive, where difference has become divisive, now it's a hard issue. They're not hospitality-like. They're, they're just divisive. Well, look who showed up. That kind of stuff. That's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Disciples who differ prioritize hospitality over hostility. Now we're going to have the fight. Here's what it looked like. It's amazing. Join me in the text, beginning in verse 6 of chapter 15. Then the apostles and the elders assembled to consider this matter. It was a separate assembly to welcome and be hospitable. Now we're going to move into the assembly where we're going to have the fight. Then the apostles and the elders assembled to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you and that by my mouth the, the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. This is recorded earlier in the book of Acts. And God who knows the heart testified to them by giving the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God? By putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way that they are. The argument, the fight, goes down in three stages. Step one, the theology. Peter hits it out of the park. Step two, the illustration. Paul and Barnabas are going to give it here in the next verse. Step three, the reminder of the scriptural principle by James, the brother of Jesus, who is known as the chief apostle along with Peter during this time in the church history. The theology. 
Disciples who differ have a foundational working knowledge of grace. Disciples who differ understand that there is one posture of faith and it's on our knees. Crowns off. Weeping for one of two reasons. That we don't deserve to be on our knees in the presence of the Lord or that we are. That's it. Disciples who differ understand the foundational working knowledge of grace. Peter says, are you guys kidding me? At any time in Israel's history, if the Lord decided to kill every male who hadn't been observant to circumcision, we wouldn't be a nation anymore. And now we're going to require it? Do I need to go on with the other requirements of the law that we've never fulfilled? Have we forgotten the Babylonian expulsion? 70 years because we couldn't keep our stuff together. We couldn't be faithful under one righteous king for the second righteous king. We, we could only be faithful for like 30 or 40 years out of click before we started doing crazy stuff. And now we're demanding the same kind of stuff of somebody else and we can't even do it? Are you nuts? And this is how he says it. Are you testing God? Woo, that's a powerful concept. When you're learning how to fly an airplane, you get exposed to so many different areas of knowledge that it creates an environment where you just start asking question after question after question because you honestly don't know how airplanes fly yourself. And you're learning. And so at some point in your learning process, you ask a question that is completely insane and your instructor looks at you and says, I'm not a test pilot. Test pilots get paid to do that kind of stuff. Are you getting paid as a test pilot? And well, no, I, I'm not getting, so no, you can't do that in an airplane. Okay, well, I don't know what airplanes do. I'm learning about airplanes. I obviously crossed the line. You can't fly upside down for you know 30 minutes at a time or the wings will flop off. Okay, I thought I'd ask because no, that is outside the bounds of physical law and the manufacturer's intention. And unless you're getting paid as a check pilot, don't do that. That's dumb. That's how in the world of aviation, they say you just crossed the line. Thank you for asking the question, but there are such things as dumb questions. And that was one of them. Don't do that. Peter's like, are you getting paid? Because if you are getting paid as a test pilot, then you're getting paid to risk your life. You're getting paid to push the laws of physics and the manufacturing intent. And you're either a hero and everybody learns something or you're dead and everybody learns something, but you're getting paid well. This is why we have theologians and scholars. They're our test pilots. Peter said, are, 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 are you test pilots? You have a motivation here. You're being compensated somehow by asking a really bad question. Are you, are you testing God? What's your motivation? Are you getting richly compensated somehow? Because no, we're asking these people who are not us to be like us when at the end of the day, we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way. Disciples who are divisive will not extend the grace to others that they extend to themselves. Differing disciples have a foundational working knowledge of grace, which means they share that grace. Divisive disciples will not extend the same grace that they themselves enjoy. Moving on, Acts chapter 15, verse 12, time for the illustration. Powerful theological argument. Peter just goes, wham, he's a fisherman. Woo, this guy tears it up. Time to illustrate the truth. Then the, the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Peter lays down the, the theology from history, and now Paul and, and Barnabas are illustrating it. Listen to how the Lord is working through these Gentiles. Are you telling me this wasn't done by the, by the Holy Spirit? Because we were there, and we're telling you. Powerfully illustrated. Disciples who differ celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. Disciples who differ celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And when we're talking about celebrating the work of the Holy Spirit, we know that the Holy Spirit gives different gifts to different people at different times to do different jobs. Praise the Lord. Disciples who are divisive will not celebrate a work of the Holy Spirit in another believer's life. A disciple who is divisive will not celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit in a neighboring church. Disciples who are divisive will not celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit in a different denomination. Obviously, we have to test the fruit. Obviously, we need to make sure that it is the Holy Spirit that is at work. But disciples who differ are able to celebrate the Holy Spirit working in a different way that is outside of their experience. Divisive disciples cannot. Continuing in the text, Acts chapter 15, the last section of scripture that we're going to look at here, verses 13 through 21. Now James steps up. He's going to seal the deal right here. What do we do when different becomes divisive? After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Peter, has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written. I know you know this, but just to remind you, there was no New Testament text at this time. The only scripture they had was the Old Testament. So basically, when he's ref what he's going to do here is he's cracking open his Bible. This is what's happening right here from the book of Amos. After these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent, David's fallen house, David's fallen family. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again so the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who does these things known from long ago. Guys, 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 guys. Don't you remember the whole reason God chose a precious and special and holy people for himself was so that the whole world would be drawn to the Lord through our testimony of him? When the Lord rebuilds David's house, it's gonna look warm and cozy, not just to Jews, but to anybody that the Lord calls. This is, this is chapter and verse. You're saying this is new and wacky, this is prophesied. This is, this is supposed to happen. Guys, get back to the scripture. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. And this is going to sound crazy, but the penny's going to drop here in a second. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. Okay, Josh, I was tracking with you this whole sermon. It's actually halfway decent, but you lost me. What? Hang tight. For since ancient times, Moses has had those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. Here's the conclusion of this passage. Here's the resolution of this issue. Here's the final part of this sermon. This is what this letter means, those, those four wacky things. Some of them make sense. You know, don't, don't eat anything that was dedicated to an idol. The church has always been known as a place where sexual morality is delighted in. One man, one woman, forever, for life. We're not known for being sexually immoral. We get that. But what's this about eating anything that has been strangled and from blood? These four principles, here's the idea that makes them cohesive and something that, as you follow the text, is celebrated by the church in Jerusalem and by the church in Antioch is this, that these four guidelines allowed differing disciples to share meals together. There was no PG sermon. There was no extracurricular activities when they got together to party. There was nothing about the meal that would offend an Orthodox Jew. And everybody was welcome to the meal regardless of the status of their skin flaps. These four things basically say you don't have to be a Jew to have a meal, but there are some things we're going to do to respect our friends who are Jews. 
These four guidelines only make sense if you understand that this ruling, that this fight, that this debate that had taken weeks, if not months, the end all be all resolution was how can we move forward so that we can have a meal together? Because during a meal in the first century church, it always ended with communion. They broke bread together. What do we have to do so that regardless of our differences, when we have made a decision of faith, we can extend hospitality to each other in a way that honors the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we celebrate communion together. So we're gonna stay away from things that we know are not gonna work for Jews no matter how hard they try, and we're gonna stay away from things that uh, prevent Gentiles from being able to join. These are simple things. The, these basic things about the laws of Moses have been taught for centuries. Everybody knows that a Jew won't eat meat that still has blood in it. At that time, everybody knew it anyways. And with this, I'm wrapping up our message this morning. Differing disciples move forward by defining their fellowship so that they may continue to differ. Let me say that again. Differing disciples move forward by defining their fellowship. What can I do for you? What can you do for me so that we can enjoy each other's company so that we may continue to differ. Maybe I won't wear my MAGA hat to the next time I have coffee with you, right? That kind of stuff. Does differing disciples move forward by defining their fellowship so that they may continue to be different? Divisive disciples won't. There's no way I'm gonna hang out with that person. He might wear his MAGA hat. There's no way I'm gonna hang out with that person because I can't wear my MAGA hat. Are you joking me right now? That doesn't mean anything. Not compared to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, where everyone kneels and takes their crown off and is weeping for one reason or another. Differing disciples move forward by defining their fellowship, the theology of what binds us together, illustrated by the work of God in our midst rooted in knowledge of God's promise that this is what heaven looks like. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every land, every ethnicity on their knees, crowns off, weeping for one or two reasons or maybe both at the same time. Differing disciples move forward by defining their fellowship so that they may continue to differ. I started this morning by saying, what does River Church look like? Let me finish by saying, what does River Church sound like? Kevin mentioned it this morning already. It sounds like, I had this amazing perspective of the sound of River Church yesterday. I heard it for the first time, because normally it's me and two or three contractors rattling around a big empty building. But I'm on scaffolding with Seth, 15, 20 feet above the floor. I can see everything, bird's eye view. And all of the noise from the building is just mingling. And so while Seth and I are cutting in the trim, don't look too close. <laughs> It's this beautiful sound. It was women talking about their children and they haven't had the opportunity to hear about other people's children in a while. And, and my mother-in-law was there, who's an amazing influence and she's a part of that conversation. And there's empty nesters there, then they're part of that conversation. And, and then there's loud noises because there's guys outside siding and so there's wanging on the wall. Like the building came alive. It sounded like different people in different walks of life, at different times of life, with different experiences, delighting in hearing and being heard. It was amazing. And that was like only 20 or 30 people. The building is designed for 250. What do you think that's gonna sound like? That's what I'm talking about. And I, and I think as a church, we know that we're hoping that different people come, people that we don't agree with. And I, I love the guidance from this morning. How do we move forward without being divisive? Disciples who differ submit themselves to biblical authority. Disciples who differ prioritize hospitality over hostility. Disciples who differ have a foundational working knowledge of grace. <clears throat> Disciples who differ celebrate the work of the Holy Spirit. Disciples who differ 
move forward by defining their fellowship so that they may continue to differ. Because <laughs> it's amazing. Would you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, there may be someone this morning who has allowed division to creep into their heart and they have never made a decision of faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they've seen too many Christians who are divisive. Why would I want to partner with a God whose own people are divided? No way, not for me. But after seeing what the goal is, what, what your scripture teaches, we understand, oh no, I've just been looking at people who haven't been living it out. That it is your desire to partner with us even though we're different. You created those differences. And so maybe someone is feeling accepted and loved and appreciated by you in a way that they've never experienced before. And it's a simple declaration. Heavenly Father, thank you for making me who I am. Thank you for making me different. But now understanding how you have provided for me and the plan that you have for me, I give it all to you. I do not lift up my differences or my uniquenesses as a barrier between me and you. I submit them to you. Lord, would I humble myself to you. I ask for your forgiveness for the areas of my life where I have failed myself and my loved ones and my family and you. And Lord, I want to partner with your son, Jesus Christ, by faith so that you can use my differences and I don't feel like an outcast, but part of this beautiful mosaic that you're creating. For others of us, Lord, just as Christians who maybe in our hearts or in our minds or in our social media presence have crossed the line from being different to divisive, we repent of that. We have made our differences more important than the theology and the sacrifice of Jesus that unites us. And Lord, we are sorry. We turn from that. Would you give us great wisdom and love for each other as we work out what it means to fellowship with each other while we are still going to be different? Lord, that would be a work of the Holy Spirit. We pray that that would be the experience when people walk into River Church, that they wouldn't see a homogenous group, but they would see a diverse group, all with the idea that we submit everything to you and allow you to be magnified above our differences, uniting us even in our differences. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we wrap up our time together this morning?
Heavenly Father, we claim this promise by faith that when your people who are called by your name humble themselves and pray that you bring healing to them and their land, and we like to throw this promise in too, that we would be known by our love for each other, that as we celebrate our differences that you gave us, we work through the things that could be divisive. We know that your gospel will be proclaimed unhindered when we're able to experience that. Would you allow us to be hospitable to each other? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and God bless.